something that's definitely happening with applications right now. People yeah. are buying the same thing, the same capability that they could get in a web browser or in a more complex application, in a desktop application, they're buying a little iPhone version or a little widget version, yeah. or in our case, a little Air version. And that thing does much less than the capabilities of the website or the desktop application, and they're paying for less. Talking about iPhone apps and what we've learned from them, we're still in a, in a discovery process, but there is huge price elasticity in eBooks. Yeah. What we found uh, is that down at that four ninety nine kind of price point on the iPhone, we're seeing sometimes as a, a hundred times as great a level of sales. Yeah. So we're actually making uh, a lot more money uh, charging four ninety nine than we are charging twenty bucks for an ebook. Right. Now what we're trying to figure out is, you know, it's pretty clear that the iPhone use case is somewhat different than say the desktop use case. So uh, selling somebody something that they could use uh, on their laptop may be more competitive with what with the, the print book mm -hmm. right you know in terms of you know we're still the way I think about publishing is we're we're in a, a bit of a horse race we're, we're trying to see how fast we can grow those online revenues and the online distribution system uh, as print declines how do those two curves look? I yeah, mean, don't want yeah. to give too much away, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> are they yeah. crossing one another? Are they? Uh, they're a long way from crossing, right. but uh, there's no question that that uh, I think print will decline. Yes. And certainly, if you look at, at if I again, if I think about my business and uh, my core technical book business, our 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 average uh, revenue per title is about 40% of what it was in 2000. Mm. So that tells you how far it's come down. Right. You know, Almost all of that is competition with free sources of information. Right. Uh, it's just so much easier to get you know, quality information uh, for nothing. And you know, some publishers say, oh, this is really bad. And I say, well, wait a minute. If I, you gotta put the user uh, in the picture. And the user thinks it's good, right? That they can get this stuff for free. And the people who are creating the content think it's good. They have a different business model. I mean, their business model might be promoting their business, promoting their services, promoting their, their personal brand, it might be uh, getting advertising. But they're competitors like any other. And, and you know, this idea that somehow any business should be protected against its competitors just because they have a different business model is, Doesn't make sense. is, is crazy because yeah. ultimately it, it won't work. If somebody has come up with a better mousetrap, uh, you better you know, start figuring out how to trap mice yourself. One thing that doesn't come up much in conversation with you and does come up with other publishers is that the vast majority of big time publishers out there are ad supported. And so their move to the web was a disaster yeah. in terms of the amount they had to invest and how little they've returned. Yeah, but the thing about that too is, is again, from the user point of view, uh, advertising became more efficient mm -hmm. you know keyword advertising on search engines uh, you know delivers better results you know I have many times clicked on a Google ad uh, I have almost never clicked on a banner ad or a pop-up ad right Google figured out that there was a, a use case where you're identifying people are searching for something, and it stripped a lot of fat. I mean, David Wanamaker's old, you know, axiom. You know, 50% of my advertising doesn't work. I just don't know which half. Um, you know, has always been true, and it's much less true today because all of a sudden we can, uh, you know, we can understand that that when people really are looking for something, advertising does work. So that's one part of advertising. There's more just the sort of brand building or impression aspects of it. Yeah. You talk to the publisher of Vogue magazine. Yeah. 75% of the magazine is advertising. Mm -hmm. And that advertising is really valuable to that yeah. consumer. Uh, I think there are other examples of that that are things that where you want to be immersed in essentially their products. Yeah. Um, but that's what you want to focus on. That hasn't translated to the web as well. You know, well. I don't know that I agree with that. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, again, it's one of these cases where you're blinded by what you expect. I mean, the web is one giant advertisement. That's true. You know, I mean, look at that. I mean, you know, uh, 
in the old days, you know, Adobe.com, uh, you know, yeah. wouldn't have existed. You would have had to go do advertisements and all those trade rags, That's right? True. And now people, you know, they can find you, they can link to you, and you know, this was really, you know, I was the first person ever to put an ad on the World Wide Web. You know, in, in 1993 when we launched GNN. That's something and, to be proud of. And it was really inspired by those bingo cards that you used to have in, uh, you know, in old print publications. You probably, right. you know, if you're old enough, you remember this stuff. You, you'd see the ads and you would have this little card and you'd you know, fill in 99 with a number two pencil and advertiser number 99 would send you a follow-up packet. That's right. And now you click on a link. Yeah. You know, so there, there are links all over the web, but because they class it as not advertising, it's building a website, you know, they, they miss the fact that there's just as much economic activity as just going through a different channel. Yeah, probably more if yeah. the last couple of bubbles were any indication. Michael, your, <laughs> your uh, title is VP of Experience Design. That's what I hear. So when you think about publishing, you think about experiences. Yes, and one of the biggest that challenges mean? that we have right now is that so much of that experience is outside of our control. It blows me away when we talk about or think about the ebook experience. Uh, we're focused pretty heavily on what that means and what it's like. And as I talk to more and more customers and consumers about what they value in a book reading experience, I expected it to be the flip of the page. It turns out it's the cat on their lap and how soft their couch is and whether or not there's light over their shoulder. I don't have any control of any of those things. Those aren't technological things. Mm -hmm. It's interesting as we talk about how publishing is going to change, mm -hmm. we have to talk about how the forms of the things that you publish change. Right. But it seems like those contexts and environments are changing. Well, too. they're absolutely. I was thinking, you know, uh, experience. Nike Plus. Yes. You know, uh, I'm running with someone else. Uh, who's not with me right and you start thinking about music well you know people now often run with a with a soundtrack yep. you know and is anybody publishing running soundtracks you know i could easily imagine you know uh, you know somebody who you know with location based services you start thinking about yeah we're going to have this music for this hill that we know is coming up yeah. you know this this you know that would be experience design to me you know and i have to admit i did yeah. download lance armstrongs uh -huh. uh, running music track. Remember he went through this period yeah, yeah. before he went back to being yeah. one of the top cyclists in the world where he was trying to run marathons? Yeah. I downloaded it and I ran and I got to be Lance running. I mean, yeah, I there's so much there about the possibilities of the future. And yeah. I think with eBooks, you have to think, how are people reading them? Yes, there is that old reading experience where you sit down and you know chair, but now the new one might be you know certainly if you, if Japan is to be trusted, it's on the subway, you know, yeah. or it's at the bus stop, or it's at, and so there's a kind of occasional reading that's happening that the device is really optimal for. And again, it's important to realize that many of the forms that we take for granted today uh, grew up out of occasional content. Dickens was serialized. Right. You know, it wasn't you know actually you know that big fat tome that you sat down with. It was a it was a pamphlet. You know that you kind of got every you know a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs>